about 20 slides out of a 60, 70 slide briefing that I've been doing for about three years, really since about two weeks after 9-11. Right up to 9-11, I was working with a firm called Cantor Fitzgerald. Um, and we were doing a series of workshops atop World Trade Center One where we brought together uh, Wall Street CEOs, uh, national security uh, decision makers, subject matter experts to explore, uh, in effect, how globalization and the rise of the information age alters our definitions of national security and international stability. Uh, that got wiped off the map on 9-11 because Cantor lost 658 people that day. And then I went on and did a 20-month stint working uh, for my old boss, who uh, was previously the president of the Naval War College, went on to work for Secretary Rumsfeld his, as his transformation guru, a guy by the name of Art Zabrowski. He asked me to put together a grand strategy sort of argument for the United States after 9-11, uh, and we've been pushing this vision ever since. Uh, if you want to get a longer sense of the briefing, uh, first, I advocate, of course, buying the book. Uh, second, uh, if you come to thomaspmbarnett.com, you can click on a hot link, go to C-SPAN, and see a three-hour version of the brief, which they stream uh, off their website, or you can simply buy the DVD. But uh, this is the book, and the reason why I'm glad C-SPAN gets all those uh, DVDs sold and gets to keep all the money and I don't get a dime is because uh, thanks to book notes, I got a New York Times bestseller, and, and uh, Brian Lamb was really the only person on television who can deliver that kind of power. So uh, rather than give him my firstborn, better to give him all the proceeds from the DVD. We don't have any sound. I'm going to give you an argument about how to look at the world. I'm going to take you back to the beginning of the Cold War. I'm going to say in the 50s and 60s, where we had our stuff, meaning where we had our troops deployed, where we had bases, and where we did our business was in sync. And you can come down just a little bit. We had our stuff and we did our business in Western Europe. Think Berlin crises, think about the rebuilding of Germany which took about 12 years. We had our stuff and we did our business in Northeast Asia. Think about MacArthur in Japan. Think about the Korea War. Think about a bridge too far in Vietnam. Your basic containment package, box the Soviets in on both sides, protect Japan, Western Europe. Don't worry about the fallout. Four key events across the 1970s start pulling us towards that center of the world. So we shouldn't be surprised that after roughly 30 years of not really achieving any sort of security success in the Middle East. Uh, we're desperate to transform the region after a 9-11 happens. Because we've been there for a good three decades. How did we get there? First, European detente settled the question of superpower rivalry between us and the Soviets, sent that competition south with the fall of the Portuguese Empire in 1975. The Soviets got countries of socialist orientation throughout the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. We countered with the Reagan Doctrine, which was a lot cheaper. We sold the rebels arms. 73 war alerts us to the functioning of the global economy, oil as a potential disruptive element in that economy. I could show you the crisis response pattern, meaning where we responded to crises geographically. For European command, that shift from one side of the Mediterranean to the other as the 1970s unfolded. Same thing happened on the other side of the world. Vietnam ends, follow the Shah of Iran. I could show you the crisis response data from PACOM, Pacific Command, based in Honolulu. It shifted from one side of Asia to the other. By the time we created CENTCOM, Central Command, now the most famous of the CANs, already for the 1980s, inside that red circle, you could locate over 50% of the crisis response days when you add them up for the four services, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Army. For the Navy and Marines, it was almost 75%, meaning the market into which we sought to export security had shifted dramatically and focused very much so on the Middle East by the early 1980s. Jump ahead to 2000. Bush administration comes into power. They accuse the Clinton administration of focusing inordinately on creating and nurturing the growth of the international financial architecture. Say they've been ignoring 
the decay of the international security architecture. Kenneth Fitzgerald had a way of describing the 1990s, very similar. They said politics didn't keep pace with economics, security didn't keep pace with technology. And that's basically what the Bush administration accused the Clinton administration of doing. Running wild with globalization, the economic process, not dealing with the security issues that arose in that aftermath. My problem with the Bush administration was they got fixated on China. When I did my workshop series atop World Trade Center 1, 107th floor, windows on the world, we'd have people sitting around a giant U-shaped table. We'd be talking about the future of the world, future of globalization, what could derail it. And on one side of the table, the Wall Street CEOs said, China, future of integration, future of investment, future of production, future of profit. And on the other side of the table, we had the admirals and the generals from the Pentagon, and they said, China, future of danger, threat military aggression, war. So the Pentagon's map and Wall Street's map overlapped precipitously on China. That gets wiped off the map with 9-11. China's a huge historical beneficiary of that process because they become our new friend on that basis. And we stopped fixating on them because we've got somebody else to worry about. I'm going to draw you a new map of the world. I'm going to say a country or region is functioning within globalization if the following characteristics are roughly met. First, it welcomes both the connectivity and can handle the content flows associated with globalization. Everybody likes connectivity. Not everybody can handle the content flows. Here's an example. Barbie the doll was kicked out of Iran two years ago. Barbie had infiltrated Iranian toy store shelves through the global connectivity of retail. She began selling like hotcakes. The mullahs became very upset with this. They called her a Trojan horse of Western imperialism. They created Sarah, moon face doll, covered head to toe, black cloth. Put her on the shelf next to Barbie. Sarah did not sell like hotcakes. <laughs> the mullahs issued sort of a fatwa against Barbie. Detain her where she is found. <laughs> Barbie became, for all practical purposes, a doll on the run. So not everybody can handle the Britney Spears videos coming at you 24-7. They want the connectivity, but when you shove images of women in very different situations than they're used to, and that's fundamentally something we see with globalization time and time again, connectivity coming into traditional societies, disproportionately empowering women relative to men. If you want to get a society and its young males really pissed off, start messing with their definition of women. To be functioning is to seek to harmonize your internal rule set with the emerging global rule set. Free trade, free markets, transparency, collective security. Does it look like Americanization? Absolutely. Why? We're the world's oldest and most successful multinational economic and political union. 230 some years counting. Got a single currency a long time ago, I remind my European friends. <laughs> Have we fought clashes along the way? Yes, one huge violent one called the Civil War. We're fighting a rule set clash right now on gay marriages. And every time we fight one of these rule set clashes, we are reminded yet again that we are 50 member states. Massachusetts can do what it damn well pleases. As can California, as can Alabama. Most of our political history is based on that reality. So there is no conflict. You can show me around the world that I can't show you in our past. Genocide, debates about when it's OK to kill people of a certain skin tone, hugely religiously tinged violence. It's all in our past. I'll say the global rule set's always evolving. It's not just Davos man's definition. It's not just Seattle man's definition. Increasingly, it's going to be Osama man's definition. Osama said to the Europeans this spring, you got 90 days to get out of our neck of the woods, or I'll seek to kill you all. A rather harsh definition of globalization. Direction is critical not to, uh, direction is critical not to the degree of change. What do I mean by that? Good example, China still ruled by a Communist Party whose ideological mix is about 30% Marxist-Leninist, about 70% the Sopranos. 